Cemetery Stories is a community storytelling event that takes place at historic Fairview Cemetery in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is a program partnership between the New Mexico Humanities Council and historic Fairview Cemetery. It's an opportunity for community members to immerse themselves in the grounds and explore Fairview. They have the opportunity to walk around the graves and visit notable gravesides of historic figures in New Mexico and Albuquerque's history. We have local historians and scholars and experts giving presentations on the personal lives of these historic figures. At the end of the evening, we have a story slam that takes place on the main stage. And the purpose of having a story slam in a cemetery is to unite the community around the universal experience of loss, grief, memorial, death and dying. We're presenting this program inside of a cemetery because we want to reinvigorate people's relationships to cemeteries and graveyards. Cemeteries originally were public parks and public spaces, and we want to reintroduce that social aspect of these public spaces to our community. This year's Cemetery Stories took place on November 11th, 2023, which was Veterans Day. At Fairview Cemetery, there are over 500 veterans from New Mexico and all around the country interred there. And we wanted to acknowledge Veterans Day by focusing our historic walking tour on notable military historical figures in New Mexico. We presented on James Santiago Hubble, the Rough Riders of New Mexico, and the Buffalo Soldiers of New Mexico. Hello, my name is David Ottaviano, and I work for Bernalillo County Open Space, and I work at the Gutierrez Hubble House, which is a historic house built in the 1850s that was home to uh, James Hubble, or also known as Santiago, who's buried here uh, on my, my left over my left shoulder here. Uh, James was really a fascinating figure. He um, was a Connecticut Yankee. He was born in the 1820s in Connecticut and um, came out on the Santa Fe Trail in the 1840s and then later enlisted during the Mexican-American War. He came in uh, to Santa Fe after Kearney's army had taken Santa Fe. Um, but he was sort of the reinforcements that came after. He served for about a year and then later was discharged, honorably discharged, and uh, had fallen in love with New Mexico at that point and then uh, was, uh, fell in love with Juliana Gutierrez, who was from a very prominent uh, Hispanic family down in the South Valley, which is the South Valley today, but then it was the village of Pajarito, just south of us. So they had uh, eight children who lived to adulthood, uh, and they were very very uh, a prominent New Mexican family for the time. Probably their most well-known child was uh, J.L. or Lorenzo Hubble, who would later open his own trading post. The best known is the Hubble Trading Post, which was also where his home was. Um, and that's a national park uh, historic uh, uh, site today. Um, James would... Uh, Continue after the Mexican-American War in the 1850s. He marries Julian in 1849, which is right at the start of the Mexican period of New Mexico. Um, and uh, the children were uh, really interesting. Their eight children were bilingual, bicultural, very comfortable um, weaving back and forth between their Hispanic relatives and their American relatives. Uh, James... Um, was very active as a trader during the 1860s and 70s. Um, by the late 1870s, railroads were making real inroads into New Mexico, and so the trading business was really starting to unravel. He was also getting older, kind of retired um, by the 1880s, which was really the end of, of, of these caravans, these long, these really huge caravans that he was putting together during the, the 1860s and 70s. He dies in 1885, and by that point again, the trading business is over. His son, who inherits the house, uh, Felipe, uh, became a farmer, but did operate the store. The store closes in 1929. A lot of history um, took place at the Gutierrez Hubble House. The home itself is a very important, architecturally uh, important home. It's a uh, built in the uh, territorial style. It's an authentic adobe structure worth checking out. So it's open to the public. Again, it's owned by Bernalillo County Open Space, and I encourage you to, to check it out and come by. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Melanie Laborwit and I'm a historian here in New Mexico and I'm here to talk about New Mexico's Rough Riders. The Rough Riders came to fame and during the Spanish-American War in 1898 and served with, notoriously, with Theodore Roosevelt before he became president. Um, the Rough Riders were recruited largely from New Mexico Territory, Arizona Territory, and what used to be Indian Territory in Oklahoma today. And Roosevelt was serving at the time as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He was in the cabinet when rumbles of war started happening in Washington. They needed to raise um, a regiment quickly and they sent the troop trains, Roosevelt said, across the West. You wanted guys who already knew how to ride, they already knew how to shoot. What better way to get troops than get a bunch of cowboys and we'll just go down to Cuba and, and rough them up. They got called the Rough Riders while they were being um, enlisted and also during the training, which did happen in Texas, which is why the Texans claim the Rough Riders. Um, but most of them, they were a bunch of Ivy League boys who knew the Roosevelts and they were in all of the right clubs at Yale and Princeton and, and Harvard. <laughs> and all of these crazy cowboys who refused to wear their uh, Brooks Brothers designed by Theodore Roosevelt uniform <laughs> properly. And they wore them all different ways. They wore their own cowboy hats. They brought their own guns and knives and various belts and they were pretty they got photographed a lot while they were in training in san antonio this was the first united states volunteer cavalry it's the last time that a, a troops were training on horseback in 1898 um, the main blew up in um, april of that year and this they were already ready to go down in june the irony is they got down to Tampa and there weren't enough ships. They set sail without their horses. The boats to come for the horses never arrived. And so the rough riders who had trained on their horses ended up walking into Cuba. And um, later on, they became known at the, the um, commanding officer was a Colonel Leonard Wood. Some press named them Woods Weary Walkers. <laughs> Later on, they were, as they were um, bushwhacking through jungles and various places and onto the beaches. They were the first U.S. volunteer cavalry. And interestingly, most, there were all these troops, they were troops A through S, I believe. And they all had different groups, troops, F, G, H, I, J, and K were almost entirely New Mexican. And you see this, you see this insignia shield here on the stone, for, and you see the Spanish-American War. Um, just over here, there's about three other fellows who are um, buried. We have over there, we have a fellow, um, Corporal T. Brown in Troop I. And he has very he exact same insignia on there. And just further to um, the east of that, a little bit further up is uh, Sergeant William Moffat. He's from the second US Volunteer Cavalry. And what did that indicated? There were other troops that arrived and came to Cuba, but they were not all at the famous Battle of San Juan Hill in the same place. Um, there's a couple of others that as you go through here, if you're on your own and you travel through the cemetery, you may see some that have the same insignia. There's another one that is from a first U.S. government infantry um, and same um, war, but most likely served in the Philippines. And a lot of us forget that the Spanish-American War, which we started in Cuba, and then we joined in an engagement in Puerto Rico and claimed it as ours. We also um, went to fight in the Philippines the following year as part of the Spanish-American War, which went on for a couple of years. And then the United States occupied the Philippines for decades. 
Um, and a lot of people forget that that was also once part of American territory and then was um, given back to the Filipinos many, many, many decades later. The first reunion that was held of the Rough Riders was held here in New Mexico. Las Vegas was the biggest city at the time. In 1899, Roosevelt came in and instead of staying at the fancy hotel there, everybody stayed in their tents on the plaza at Lincoln Park, which was pretty amazing, but did go get drunk at the Castaneda. But every year they came back to New Mexico to have for a few years to have their reunions. And then they met in different places around the different territories. They would come back starting in the 1950s. Those that were left um, came back for their reunions every year thereafter to the last man. Probably the um, most well known of New Mexico's Rough Riders, he's not buried here, but um, we can think of him, is Maximiliano, Maximiliano Luna. Um, Luna, for whom Las Lunas is named for, um, came from a really renowned um, Spanish family. And um, he served in Cuba. The men who were bilingual, you're fighting with the Cubans against the Spanish. It was really helpful to have the Nuevo Mexicanos. And Roosevelt wrote a whole section about it in his memoir in 1899 called The Rough Riders. And Roosevelt wrote about the importance of these men who were bilingual and Maximiliano Luna in, in particular. Colonel Leonard Wood, who was a Brigadier General, wrote to the New Mexican um, after the Battle of San Juan Hill and thanked the New Mexicans for sending Maximiliano Luna to lead the campaign and that he was cool and honorable and one of the best officers he had ever served with and thanked all the New Mexicans for sending him. So um, I, I will point out this guy, George Wright, who we found out is from Madrid. There's some really great publications. The stories read like fiction and um, they had some wild stories to tell for sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Historic Fairview Cemetery. During the Civil War in 1862 through 1865, 180,000 African-American soldiers served in the Union Army in volunteer regiments. The first all-black unit was formed November 1862 as the first regiment of South Carolina volunteers. After the war, Congress passed a bill increasing the size of the Army during peacetime and establishing African-American regiments. July 1866, black men were now allowed to enlist. Six regiments were created, 9th and 10th Cavalry, 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry. The infantry was later reduced to the 24th and 25th in 1869. These troops acquired their name Buffalo Soldier from their demonstration of battle in the field, combination of their with their hair type. The Confederates desertion rate during the Civil War was between 10 and 15 percent. The Union desertion rate was between 9 and 12 percent. The Buffalo Soldier desertion rate was zero percent. Partially due to their loyalty to their country and their desire for freedom, most of the men knew that they were sacrificing themselves for the future of the race as a whole and chose the task of proving their integrity in order to accept, be accepted as equals. Private Delane Woods was born in 1897 in Mississippi. His parents were Albert Woods and Mary Killiard. He is listed in the census record as mulatto. Delane served with distinction with the Buffalo Soldiers of the 25th Infantry, Company A, as a private first class, stationed in Arkansas. In 1920, he lived in a boarding house and worked at the mill in St. Louis, Missouri. This is where he met his future wife, Criselda, from New Mexico, who was 10 years his junior. The union brought them a gift of children, Deland Jr. and Albert. Deland Jr. had a zest for life and actively participated in the Boy Scouts of America here in Albuquerque. Private Deland Wood Sr. died of tuberculosis of the spine March 24, 1940 in Fort Bayard, New Mexico, which is just north of Santa Clara. <clears throat> Private Henry Winstead, this is his stone right here. 
Private Henry Winstead was born July 12, 1844 in North Carolina. His parents were also North Carolinians. He initially enlisted in the 57th Colored Infantry during the Civil War. This regiment was attached to the District of Eastern Arkansas, 7th Corps. They were stationed near Little Rock and were involved in assorted skirmishes and conducted operations against Confederate General Joe Shelby. 1885 census records show Private Winstead as being married to wife Anne, living in Deming, New Mexico, and working as a cook at the Bellevue Hotel. An 1889 census record shows him married to Phoebe, Phoebe Chavez and that four children resulted from their union. An 1898 newspaper article noted that Henry Winstead had charge of the cuisine at several restaurants in Albuquerque, including San Felipe and the Midland Dining Parlors. Private Winstead passed away on February 19, 1926. His death was noted in the Albuquerque Morning Journal the next day and indicated that he had lived in Albuquerque for 40 years. His services were held at the Methodist Church on Cole Avenue. Private Samuel Scott was born in Lynchburg, Virginia, January 16, 1875. Standing 5'4", at the age of 24, in March of 1899, he enlisted in the United States Army in Boston, Massachusetts. His occupation was listed as a baker. Private Scott was assigned to the 9th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, Company A. The 9th Cavalry, Cavalry played a significant role in the Spanish-American War, demonstrating their bravery and combat prowess. Their achievements during this conflict led to a historic event in 1903, in which they were designated as the Honor Guard for President Theodore Roosevelt and escorted him uh, on his journey down the Presidio in San Francisco. This was the first time that a black cavalry unit was designated so. Private Scott re-enlisted in March 1902 in the Philippine Islands. He served an additional three years before being discharged in Monterey, California. His exit evaluations noted his performance as very good. The 1900 census recorded Private Scott among military men at Fort Grant in the Arizona Territory. His role at the fort involved working as a cook, utilizing his baking skills to contribute to the well being and sustenance of his comrades. As World War I approached, Private Scott's resignation card from a registration card from September 1918 indicated that he was living in Solano, California, working as a laborer for the U.S. government. After the war, Private Scott and his wife, Blanche Jackson, relocated to Kansas City, where he pursued a career as a cook. Private Scott passed away on September 17, 1941, while traveling through Albuquerque en route to Los Angeles. Sergeant Isaac Jackson was born a slave in Kentucky. During the Civil War, he enlisted in the 109th Colored Volunteers for the Union Army. After the Civil War, Isaac Jackson enlisted for two more terms in the 10th United States Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers beginning in 1873. There he served as a scout in the Arizona and New Mexico territories. Sergeant Jackson also served a five-year term in Company C of the 24th Infantry Buffalo Soldiers before returning back to the 10th Cavalry for another five years. He served in Fort Davis, Texas and Fort Apache during this time. <coughs> Sergeant Jackson had a brilliant military record which earned him high recommendations from his commanding officer, General Miles. Sergeant Jackson lived in Albuquerque for the last 15 years of his life where he was employed as a city jailer. He passed away October 24, 1902 a little bit about us. We are <clears throat> members of the New Mexico chapter of the National Association of Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club. We ride in honor of these soldiers, 9th and 10th Cavalry, who once rode through these lands on real horses, but we do so on our steel horses. <laughs> the National Association of Buffalo Soldiers and Troopers Motorcycle Club was started in 1993 in Chicago, Illinois has now expanded to over 100 chapters nationwide, with a few overseas as well, including Hawaii. The Albuquerque chapter is the 88th chapter, 
outcome of that. And we spend our time educating general public on the history of the 9th and 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, as well as doing community service. I remember being about six or seven. I was playing outside in our small backyard with my younger brother. We were playing this game with one of those exercise balls. One of us would be laying down on the floor while the other would throw the ball as high over our heads as possible. Quickly lay back down next to the other and wait until the ball would fall and hit us, leading us into a fit of screams and giggles. We would go on letting the ball crash over our heads, our bellies, our feet, until we would get too tired. I think about this game now, nostalgically, and I feel a pang of despair. The game we chose to play was called Bombs Away. This game and one other called Cops and Robbers are true testaments how living within the US empire creates a certain desensitization to war and violence. I think about the children in Gaza and how the songs of birds have been drowned out with 25,000 tones of cool missiles, the equivalent of two nuclear bombs. How the exercise ball over my childhood head is a Lockheed Martin's Hellfire R9X missile brutally murdering Palestinian children, women, fathers, elders, and other species beings in Gaza. Since October 7th of this month and the great catastrophe of 1948 known as Nakba, we have been witnessing an ongoing genocide by the occupation that is Israel. Every morning, as the sun's curtains open up on the universe, for the past two weeks or so, I've woken up with two tears falling down my cheek. I pray for these lands, for the 11,000 martyrs and over a million displaced, for those in power to finally be convinced of others' humanity for a free Palestine. I pray for the 5,000-year-old olive tree in Al-Walaja, in the occupied West Bank, their branches being symbols of peace. I pray for indigenous peoples everywhere, returning to their homelands as stewards. I pray for sovereignty and interspecies collaboration, for elders and little elders. I pray and I pray, and I wish for the birds to carry these prayers. I cut Pueblo watermelon that we grew over the summer, a symbol of liberation, in Gaza, and I share with my roommate of Palestinian descent. Each bite, we envision a liberated world. We save the seeds, a ritual act for future fertility and growth. There is a certain moral responsibility I believe we all have here, living within the belly of the beast that is the imperial war machine of the US empire. As I see increased police funding, criminalization of dissent, ethnic cleansing, military aid to fascist states, walled cities, and surveillance capitalism. I know I need to stay grounded in hope and resistance for the seven generations ahead of me and the seven generations behind me that made my life here possible. My father is a veteran, having served in the Iraq and Afghanistan war for the US Air Force. He joined in his teenage years after immigrating from Cuba to be able to take care of his mother and younger siblings and benefit from all the resources the military would give him. A choice I have seen many disenfranchised, racialized people make out of necessity and survival. For millions of people, we are forced out from our homelands because of exploitation, colonization, and war. We are separated from our families and ways of life by inhumane colonial borders. I watched my father increasingly become hypervigilant violent and unable to break a certain state of distress, causing a lot of pain to my family and to others. Memory lives on the cellular level. I have picked up some of his qualities, always directing myself to the back of a room to see the entrance, exit, and everyone else within the space. I hear his voice in my ear saying, you always want to be aware of where the threat can come from. I try to break free from this vigilance and constant feeling of being unsafe, but we live in a hyper-militarized world where people justify over 5,000 bodies of children buried under rubble on their ancestral lands for the sake of safety. Really, it is greed, it is weaponized trauma, and it is cruel.
In the same backyard we used to play bombs away, my father forced me to kill a snake with a machete, telling me I had to learn to protect myself. I was four years old. It was an innocent snake, a black garden snake, and I have developed a deep fear and reverence for this being ever since. I have been able to forgive my father through compassion, but I also know that soldiers are meant to follow orders, and I would like us all to start questioning who is benefiting and who is suffering from the orders and rules that we choose to follow. The land remembers. The land always remembers. I started digging holes as a balm to my panic attacks, sometimes bending down into the soil and offering my screams or my cries, my tears. I feel a union in this moment, planting something, transmuting rage into life, the two of us reappearing, reborn. I think about the resilience of olive trees and the fact that it takes approximately 20 years for an olive tree to grow. In order for a just future for all of us, for a true olive branch for the world, the cycle of war and violence must be broken and people in the land need to be protected and prioritized over profit. May we discover the connection of grief and alchemy letting the darkness of this moment transform us instead of break us. May we reckon by looking into the eyes of the multi-headed beast that will come for all of us if we let it come for any of us. Palestinian liberation is all of our liberation from the river to the sea. Thank you. Russ Moga, he was born in 1916 in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Russ was smart, he was athletic, and he was very interested in all things mechanical. Anything that qualified as being a machine, or was about power, or was about speed of an engine, he was in. His state, Minnesota, had suffered the swarms of locusts that gobbled up all of the farm crops in the Dakotas, came through Minnesota, ate everything there, went down into Iowa, and finally came up into Wisconsin. I think that if it weren't for the rest of the Great Lakes, they would have made it to the coast. So, when his father came to him and said in 1940 that there jobs in California at the Lockheed Corporation's new airplane factory. The two of them together decided to move to the Golden State as quick as they could. It was a secret factory to most people, but somehow his father had figured it out, had found out about it, and they went there. Lockheed had assembled an engineering team to answer a particular contract and the facility that grew out of that contract in 1938 was so secret that Walt Disney helped hide it from view from above using painted canvas and a few fixtures they even had cows. For all the world, if you flew over it, you would have thought it was a pastoral California hillside. But inside the factory, the workers were already very busy, over time, trying to build the historic P-38 Lightning. This was a plane that was fast, high altitude, good for attack as well as interception. And it was successful in many, many combat sorties throughout the time that the U.S. wasn't involved in World War II. Once he got there and he had the job, he had a special job, another special job to do. And that was to mount a campaign, a written campaign, to his redheaded sweetheart back in Minnesota and ask her to move to California to join him. Unfortunately, the Midwest newspapers 
only wrote about the dire situation of the war, about whether the U.S. would indeed join the war, when the U.S. would join the war, and so it was difficult to convince her. But finally, she did accept not only his ring, but a $10 bus ticket all the way to Burbank, California. Once there, in 1942, these two sweetheart sentimental souls that they were got married on Valentine's Day. The war building up like that caused everybody grief, head trauma. Russ had to think about his loyalty, his sense of duty to the country, as well as he was an engineer on the line for the P-38. And he had, he had already contributed patentable changes to both the plane and the production line. Lockheed offered him a deferment. Oh, he couldn't accept it. He couldn't accept it. His co-workers and managers even all jibed about, hey, you've got to come and join up with us as they bravely went off to war. No, he didn't want to leave his brand new wife, but he also didn't want to shirk his duty to his country. Just then, Lockheed came up with another idea. He had been looking at the posters down the halls of, La of the factory, and they said, Uncle Sam wants you. And that convinced him to join the Navy. Lockheed, can, because of his patentable inventions, convinced the Navy to allow him to work within his term of duty with the Navy, and he didn't actually go overseas. His new wife and her parents were not totally convinced of the safety. Should he be called up and have to go off to war after all? So she went home to Minnesota with his brand new firstborn son in her arms. In 1946, when he finished his tour of duty, he also went back to Minnesota. But at this point, he was a mechanical engineer. He lived until he was 91, a long and interesting life. He resides now in Fort Snelling National Cemetery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, very proudly. And I know he was his own kind of hero. Thank you. I'm going to share a story with you that transitions, I was not planning to tell you, but it's a secret, transitions from past to present quite frequently. You, you will realize when I change from past to present, okay? Are you with me? Okay, so when uh, Emilio Cariaga saw Mercedes Padierna for the first time, he just thought that something was wrong. Some, something was really very wrong because that amazingly beautiful girl, I mean, she, she could just not be there. She couldn't be there showing off that beautiful shape of a body that she had just with the sole purpose of making him suffer, of making him realize how, uh, how unreachable it was for him. He had a theory. He thought, you know, pretty girls are pretty girls. Okay, but at the end of a party, they just live with somebody else. Emilio, his friends and Mercedes were part of a group of guests at Emilio's cousin's um, birthday party. And Mercedes has stayed there secluded in a corner of the room without socializing with anybody. And Emilio's friends 
were all surrounding him and looking at Mercedes and ready to teach Emilio what to do and how to go about approaching these girls in these situations. Okay, El Colo, I will say some words in Spanish. El Colo, which is a nickname, told him, you just watch and learn, okay? You better learn fast, Carriaga, because next time, if, no, if you haven't learned, you will be learning in the morgue, said the sergeant. Sergeant Vélez was in the trench. At that moment, the plane of Goose Green was the best simulation of the worst nightmare a human being have ever seen. More rounds were surrounding them, and Emilio knew very well, though he was a novice, that should a mortar get in, that was it. That would be the end of it. And he could not check anything with the sergeant because the moment the sergeant wanted to make an outing, it was there. It was just only to be left there at the mouth of the trench, three meters away from Emilio, who was there now, surrounded. It was just enough, you know, to prove what the mortars were doing, just enough to see on both sides of him, to see all his companions dead or with limbs missing. And now what? And the bomb, the bomb playing hide and seek. Let's see, Emilito. Let's see if it is your turn now. Huh? Let's see, let's see. Boom! I miss you. But just don't worry, because I have time, and I have many eyes, and I search slowly. I will find you. Let's keep playing a little bit more. Let's see, let's see. Hmm, boom, again. Oh, darn it, I miss you again. But blood, always blood around him. Yeah, I know, I'm tricky. I'm tricky, it's my turn again, the bomb said. It's my turn, said Alejandro, and headed towards Mercedes, and the boys could see that she was giving a, a definite no when he invited her to dance. So the next one was going to be Jorge. But Jorge, Emilio thought, well, Jorge is the most successful one with girls, so he'll get her. I'm sure he will. They saw him talking and talking with Mercedes, and yeah, he stayed longer than, uh, than in Colo, but what? Dancing? No way, I'm not going to dance, and you know what? The only thing I want is to be alone. What am I going to do here, alone? Alone with all these friends of mine, with all of them, with all of them, with limbs missing, some of them dead, all of them looking at me, and at that moment, one who had a, a knee, uh, a hurt knee, dragged towards him and said, hey, negro, now that the sergeant is no longer with us, now you have to be in charge. And Emilio thought, why? Why did he have to hear that? That was more on the side of the ridicule. Uh, what, what are you talking about? Are you kidding? In charge of what? Am I going to be in charge of what? Actually, he didn't know what to do, what to say, how to go about that. and. Uh, and just thought, thought about Mercedes, and the memories came to his mind. Like two hours after, Emilio's heart was still set on Mercedes. And at that moment, Mercedes started walking towards him. Ah, that miracle of 14 years old was heading towards him and he didn't know what to do. And suddenly a voice, a voice that who knows where it came from, whispered in Emilio's ears what to do and what to say. So at that moment, he stretched his arm and grabbed a carnation from a tray that a waiter was carrying with sherry glasses. And when Mercedes was at a 
caressing distance, he gave the carnation and said, take it, it's for you, looking at her clear eyes. Mercedes was stiff and threw the carnation. Thanks, would you like to dance? That moment that Mercedes accepted and invited him to dance changed his whole life forever. And that night, that night, alone in the trench, surrounded by all these noises, now the mortars come in silent, but still some rifles being heard, just to remind all those Argentinian boys that were in Malvinas that May of 1982, to remind them that the nightmare was still on, that it, had, it was not over. He was thinking and he was wondering whether Mercedes knew that he was thinking of her. And that now his mate, the one wounded on the knee, approached him and started crying. And he grabbed him in his arms and said, it's okay, we'll be okay. And he will caress his forehead and said, there's nothing to worry about. I will get you all out of this filthy ditch that we are thinking to. The rain has started to fall and they were freezing. And he told them, all of them, I will get you out of this trench. We will be okay. And the only thing we have to do now is wait for the sun to rise. And at that moment, he remembered a song by a group called Sui Generis that talked about Tuve que aceptar mi condición En invierno no hay sol No? I know, Mercedes, there is no sun, I know. But there is you and your memory, for God's sake. Clarity started coming and a group of rifles were approaching what was left of the trench. And Emilio Cariaga knew at that moment that that was the end of the war for them, but there was this horrible age. There were his partners. He was still hugging and caressing the forehead of his friend. And now he knew something else about himself. He knew that he had been born among other things. So that Mercedes would tell him that, yes, those rifles could be the end of the world. But they won't, be more. they won't. Because one day, when you had just turned 15, you stretch your arm, pick up a carnation and gave it to me. Don't let a bomb damage the carnation on the tray in a desert full of people. This was a story written by Valentino, Esteban Valentino, and I wanted to share it with you. And it refers to the Malvinas, because I think they are the Malvinas were, or the Falkland Islands back in 1982 when they were fought. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody, rub your hands together uh, like we're going to uh, start a fire through friction until you can feel the warmth. And when your hands are nice and warm, put your hands on your heart. And just remember, we're all still here above ground with beating hearts, and I hope you're all feeling warm-hearted towards yourself and each other. You can't come into a cemetery without thinking about death and life. So uh, we're honoring all of us here, those departed and all of us still here. Thanks for being here today. I grew up right across the river from a historic cemetery, the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, where Washington Irving is buried. And so as a kid, I was, my head was full of the stories of the Headless Horseman and Ichabod Crane. My best friend Hank, when we got to high school, used to take his girlfriends on full moon nights to the cemetery for a little atmosphere. <laughs> well, right behind my house, through the woods that 200 years earlier had been apple orchards, but were now 
covered over by maples and elms and oaks was a Revolutionary War era cemetery. There was one gravestone there that uh, really captured my imagination when I was a kid. It said, here lies John Coe, who died in the North River. Now that's what they called the Hudson River back in those days in the 1760s. Here lies John Coe, who perished with nine other souls in the North River. And that really shivered my timbers because around that time, my father was taking my brother and I out in the flimsiest canvas covered boat with a 10 horsepower motor out uh, where they were building the Tappansee Bridge. We were putting crab pots out for blue crab. And the thought of a watery death really, really, really scared me. It was a, uh, it was a private cemetery. That Coe and the Conklin families. The Conklins were still living in the county. They had an orchard that was selling apples in the 1760s and it was still selling apples in the 1950s and it's still selling apples today. One, one year, I was about six years old, the neighborhood dads came clippers in hands with, uh, with loppers and clippers and the neighborhood kids helped them blaze a trail from the back of our house through the woods past the cemetery to the two-room schoolhouse that I went to for the first three years of school. So imagine that, 30 years, 30, 30 miles north of New York City going to a two-room schoolhouse. And because it went past the cemetery, we called it the scare scare path. I love skeletons and the whole idea of bones. I live close to the Museum of Natural History. I would always go straight to the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Stegosaurus, the Brontosaurus skeletons. That rascal Tommy Schnell sold me a cat skeleton that I wanted to examine for five hard-earned 1950s dollars. And he demanded payment before he handed over the paper bag. And when I opened the paper bag, it wasn't exactly a skeleton. There were bones in there, but it was essentially a road-killed mummified cat about two inches thick. Trust but verify. Never forgotten that. Uh, a, a skunk died in my backyard and I went to the edge of the cemetery and, and buried it right outside the walls so that I could dig it up a year later and uh, assemble the skeleton. Years passed and you know what they say, it's part of a Beatles song, life happens, life's what happens to you when you make other plans. Well, one day I found myself sitting on the steps of, of a Victorian house in Bay City, Michigan with a human skull in my hands. And it was the first of 90 burials that uh, had been torn up by a bulldozer uh, getting ready to make a shopping center. And a salvage archeological crew that I was on came, uh, came to catalog and dig up and uh, basically at that point put the bones in a museum. Those bones have been rep repatriated since then. But you know, we never were given any kind of proper instruction about how to, how to handle human remains. I didn't really realize as a 20 year old, the significance of what I was doing. And I only learned years later, many years later, that the members of our crew had been cursed by the local Chippewas for, you know, uh, and uh, I take blame, we don't take blame, you know, we don't take blame, we didn't know what we were doing really. Uh, but uh, we were going to uh, wander aimlessly for years. And strangely enough, the next year, there I was uh, in Alaska. I thought I was on my way to Japan, but I, didn't, I ended up in Alaska for the next 10 years. And it wasn't aimless exactly, but I didn't have much of a rudder. And the next historic cemetery that I saw was the second year after I got to Alaska. I decided to float down the Yukon River in a kayak all 2,000 miles following the gold rush, the 1898 Klondike gold rush trail uh, up to Dawson City in the, in the gold fields. And in Skagway, where the Chilkat Trail starts, there was a cemetery where seven, I can't remember the, the exact number, 70 or 80 men and a few women lost their lives in an avalanche, making their way up the trail. Well, I made my way down the river that year, past individual graves and abandoned Gold Rush pioneer uh, 
cabins down through Athabascan and uh, Yupik villages. In those Athabascan villages, it was the, the gravestones were really interesting because there was a combination of the, the Athabascan cultures and the Russian Orthodox cultures. The Russians had been up the river, the first, uh, the first colonizers actually up the river, and there were interesting spirit houses built uh, around some of, some of the graves. The most interesting grave I think I ever saw, the one that, that uh, really got my attention, was in Purgatory, Alaska, a one-cabin town where they cut firewood for the steamships, uh, the paddle wheelers that came down the river. There was a guy named Bill Lanyard who cut wood, and when he died, they came and they found a, they found a gravestone, and on it was engraved, here lies the SOB who robbed my camp. Uh, the uh, the crudely written gravestone was still there. The state troopers were called in uh, after Bill didn't uh, uh, make his, uh, uh, well, he wasn't there to, to meet the steamer. The state police came in, they dug up that grave, and there was the coffin of a blue jay, which they call camp robbers in Alaska. It was one of his tricks. So I want to kind of close just by mentioning one person in particular. Uh, an Athabascan elder I met on the river. Her name was Bill Luke. I worked in a nursing home the, the winter after I went down to Yukon. Bill was at least, at least 110 years old when I met her. She might have been uh, a couple of years older. Nobody really, really knew. Bill Luke held my hand and told me about the first white man she ever saw. She told me about the first time she ever tasted refined sugar, the first time she'd ever had milled, flat, milled flour. She showed me the scars on her legs where the village medicine person uh, bled her for an, for, for an illness. I did the math. That was, that was 1971, and I thought, wow, 1971, she's 110, more or less. She was born in the 1850s. I'm talking to somebody, I'm holding the hand of somebody who was born in the 1850s. There's, you know, so we've heard, we've heard the stories that go back uh, today, the story, we've heard of stories of, this, of the Mexican-American uh, War, the Spanish-American Spanish -American War, the Civil War. It's not that long, it's not that long ago. Elsie Bolden talks about the 200-year-old present if you think about the oldest person you know right now, who might be 100 years old, and you think about a child who was born today, all of us can span 200 years right here, right now. Everyone who's here is basically living a 200 year, a 200 year old present time. And it's like uh, Leonardo da Vinci said a long time, a long time ago, and I think I'll close with this. We're telling stories, we're telling stories of life and death. We're standing in, a, in sacred ground. And as I said earlier, people below ground and, and we're above ground. We all stand here right now at the very place where everybody and everything that has ever happened before meets everybody and everything that is yet to happen. And with that, I thank you all for for coming uh, uh, for the whole event. I'm sure, uh, uh, thank you all the, the people who have shared the, the stories at the grave sites with my, my fellow tellers. Uh, I always close this way, I am who I am because of who we all are together. Thank you. I appreciate you all coming out. I know it is getting a little chilly. The sun is sinking in the west. But uh, thank you for supporting Historic Fairview Cemetery. Thank you for supporting the New Mexico Humanities Council and uh, supporting the arts in our community and history. And uh, again, thank you to all of our speakers for coming out and sharing today. And thank you for coming and being an audience. We love you. Be safe.